Mr. Collins, please join me in welcoming the author of The Best We Can Do, T. Boyd. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming here today. Um, so I've gotten a really warm welcome in the last 12 hours. I'm still a little bit on California time, so it's, it's morning for me. Um, um, I have been an educator for much longer than I've been a, um, a, a writer or an, an author. Um, I really like being around places of learning. Um, in retrospect, it's one of the best times in my life to have gotten to be a student for, for a number of years, although I am not so far away from it that I don't remember the pain of having assignments and deadlines and classes that you have to get up for. So um, I want to apologize for being mandatory reading, <laughs> and I hope, <laughs> I hope that I haven't ruined your reading experience of the book. Um, what I would like to do today is um, group all of my uh, work together under the umbrella of um, the refugee experience and also the representation of refugees when we talk about policy and um, the future. So I want to start with something I wrote uh, a couple of years ago, almost a couple of years ago, um, called Precious Time. There's nothing like losing your country when you're little to help you see nationalism as the strange and unnatural thing that it is. When I was three, my parents packed our family and all our hopes into the cargo hold of a river boat and set out to sea. We humans are about to waste a whole lot of precious time and resources fighting over who gets what. This often happens when there are major upheavals in the world Sometimes it happens because some people are hoarding most of the resources. Both these conditions are currently in place. From space, all of this seems commonplace and small. But down here on Earth, our decisions matter. And I want to take a break from that image for a second because it's an image that I've drawn that troubles me. Um, I drew it because uh, that boy, whose name is Alan Kurdi, um, perished at sea trying to escape with his family from Syria to, to, to a safer place, and he, he didn't make it. I was also three when my parents put me in the exact same situation, and I made it. So I suppose when I saw that image in the news, I had what you might call survivor's guilt. Um, I didn't understand why I made it and he didn't. And I was trying to understand that connection and try to make my own experience relevant to what was happening in the world today. Um, but as a creator, as a media maker, I felt very troubled by my decision to use that particular image, even though it was very powerful. Because I can do a little bit of research about who Alan Curdy was, I can make sure that I use his name and just not call him you know, anonymous. Uh, Syrian boy, but the truth is I don't know Alan. I didn't know Alan, I didn't know his family, so all I know is what I'm able to um, find secondhand. And so I'm not sure if I have the right or if I should even ethically be using his image even for a good cause. Um, and so it's been something I've been thinking about for the last couple of years. How do I do better? Um, and I know that I, I called my book the best we could do in a sort of like resi uh, with a sort of a resigned spirit of parenting. I was actually thinking about parenting when I came up with that title. Um, but the, the reality is that sometimes the best we could do is not good enough. And so we have to keep trying to do better than what we have done. So I'm here to offer you a couple of things that I've thought about um, in terms of coming up with a better alternative than continuing to use tragic images like Alan Curdy's body on a beach uh, to talk about refugee issues. So the best we could do is uh, an, a work of nonfiction, um, which, as my mother would say, makes it 99% true. So I'll, I'll introduce you to the characters. We'll call them characters because it is a story that was written 
Um, so it's not, it's not everything. It's what I needed to tell you the story, right? So the characters are on my left, my sisters Lan and Bic. Very important today to remember the pronunciation of Bic. Um, my mother, who I call Ma, and my father Bo, and that's three-year-old me. Now these refugee pictures, um, those of you who have read the book have seen them in the book, but if you remember, I wait till almost the very end of the book to show you these photographs, which are the only photographs in the book. Um, everybody who's gone through uh, a refugee camp experience probably has a similar ID picture, um, and it's one of the few mementos that we have of that time and experience. Um, we see these kind of pictures all the time in our media, and they are usually used to elicit our sympathy and to make us pull out our wallets and donate or um, do some other kind of good action. But the thing is, these pictures capture a very, very brief window in the lives of the people in the pictures. And so it's important to me, uh, in the, it was important to me in the writing of the book, and it's, it still continues to be important to me when I talk about the book to people to emphasize that these were people with, with whole other lives before they became refugees. And so for you, um, I hope that the reading experience allowed them to become people that you might love or maybe not like at all, um, but at least you knew them as whole human beings before they became boat people. I'm going to take you across time and space to a place in the world far from here, to a refugee camp that no longer exists. To give you context, I'm three years old, and the year is 1978, just three years after the fall of Saigon, three years after the end of the Vietnam War, but more like five years since the US has pulled out of that conflict. Now, it's important to remember that the Vietnam War was not just an American war. It was a civil war between Vietnamese people, which meant that when it ended, half of the Vietnamese were on the winning side and half were on the losing side. And if you were on the losing side, it meant a huge change in your life. It meant that the, the country that you called yours was no longer in existence. It meant the currency that you used to spend to buy everything from clothing to food to paying your rent was no longer good. It meant that your parents might be out of a job. It meant that your parents might even be in prison for being on the wrong side of the conflict. It meant that you, if you were in school at the time, might not be able to go to school in the near future. It meant that your future was very uncertain. So for my family, life became unbearable after three years of that. And so they packed all of our hopes into a riverboat that was not meant to go out on the open sea, and they went out on the open sea because they were desperate. And my father, who was not qualified to be driving a boat, actually who had never driven a boat before that, ended up being the person who piloted our boat for four days and three nights to be landed in Malaysia. A refugee camp is a bottleneck of people seeking a new home. In March of 1978, when we arrived at Pulau Bazar, there were already 3,000 people in the camp. Every week, a delegation from a different country came, France, Canada, Australia, the US, to interview people wanting to resettle there. We're going to France, we'll speak the language. Any choice was a gamble, my parents decided our future is on very little information. You only have two sisters in America. And you know I wasn't here. You didn't need to teach French in America. For children, camp was in many ways a wonderful vacation. No school.
for Ma, there's the worry of how to have and take care of a newborn baby in a refugee camp. to bring a life into the world is rewarded by that cry. It is a single-minded effort, uncluttered and clear in its objective. What follows afterward, that is, the rest of that child's life, is another story. Daily life was not easy. Water came out of ditches dug by previous residents and had to be boiled before drinking. Wood for boiling and cooking had to be gathered from the dwindling forest surrounding the camp. There were no proper toilets. Mo would take us a little further out each day to relieve ourselves and bring back some firewood. Yet we were among the lucky ones. Our stay there was only a few months. One day we heard our names called from the radio tower. On the other side of the world, Ma's older sister Dao and her husband acted as our US sponsors and processed our paperwork quickly. The Red Cross helped us get our plane tickets, and my parents promised to repay them once they had jobs. In Kuala Lumpur, we got our immunizations and our health cleared. Wow. Ow. Ouch. <laughs> All except for Bo. They said their goodbyes at the church where we slept. I borrowed $30 from an old student back camp. I used some of it to buy, our, to buy new outfits for the kids. We don't need much else to take for this trip. And then the next morning. Does anyone here speak English? There were about a hundred people who needed Ma to show them to their gates, help them check in, and fill out forms. We sat with the elderly couple, absorbed by the Hershey bar that Ma had bought for us. It's time for us to get, to the, to get on the plane. The flight attendant gave Ma a bassinet for the baby, but he cried every time she tried to put him down. She had only one cloth diaper for him, so every time he peed, she dried him with napkins and folded the cloth to move the wet spots. Just don't poop, okay? It's a long flight. My sisters and I got an airplane pin and juice, which kept us content. But then the chaos of getting in and out of Los Angeles. Customs, baggage, connecting flights. You go to gate seven, over there. Hurry, they're calling your flight. You go to terminal, you go to terminal three, follow the signs. No, please. After helping everyone else, Ma realized. Oh no, our flight's about to leave. Finally, on June 28th, 1978, we arrived at Chicago O'Hare Airport. My, my sister Dao and one of her daughters were there to meet us. Meanwhile, back in Kuala Lumpur, Ma, Bo was called upon to use his limited English to help the other refugees traveling. In Los Angeles, distracted by the needs of others, Bo actually did miss his own flight. Through broken English, a lot of gesturing, and finally a supervisor who spoke French, Bo got on a late flight to Anchorage, Alaska. He spent his first night in America on a bench in the airport. Bo's attempts to call Ma's sister on a payphone were unsuccessful. 
His experience in Los Angeles left him too nervous to leave his waiting area to go buy food. When he finally arrived at Chicago O'Hare Airport, his belly was as empty as his morale was low. Hammond, Indiana. Two hours later. Oh my god. That night we slept reunited under the same roof in a new country. Me, my baby brother, Bo, and Ma, and Lan, and Big in a two-bedroom house with my aunt, her husband, their five children, and one dog. So normally, this would be where the happy ending happens in the immigration story. The violins come out, some tears are shed, but life is lived happily ever after in the movies. But those of us who live the real story know that life just keeps going and it doesn't necessarily get all happy all at once. So I want to take you straight to the epilogue one year later. And this is a little bit out of order in how you read it. But this is how it happened. Was Bo so terrible? It's hard to remember. My memories of him live in an orange apartment building in San Diego, California. I remember blinding concrete and the rectilinear shapes of lawns and parking lots, bottle brush and cypress, these stairs, and the claustrophobic darkness inside our home. I remember streets named after states and schools named after presidents, and imagine each block, each day, turned us a little more American. The same month we moved into the orange building, a 16-year-old girl in San Diego aimed her rifle at the elementary school children across the street from her house, killing two people and injuring nine. The mayor at the time was Pete Wilson, the same California governor I would hate many years later for backing one of the most anti-immigrant laws in history. San Diego was a Naval and Marine Corps base where the wounds of the Vietnam War were still fresh and not everyone welcomed our presence. I learned about America mostly through books and TV and from what my sisters learned in school. Every morning we have to say, I pledge allegiance to the flag, one nation under God, indivisible. And as though this induction into Americanhood needed any more nudging, you stupid gook, They were reasons to not want to be anything other. For my parents, already fully formed in another time and place to which they could never go back, home became the holding pen for the frustrations and the unexercised demons that had nowhere to go in America's finest city. Thank you for reliving that part of the book. So it's really special to get to be in Minnesota talking about this book um, because it has so much Minnesota in it. And like, I don't have any Minnesota in me, so it's all a little bit secondhand. But because Balfi um, is exactly the same age as me and came over just a few years before, we grew up in the same time period in, in the US. And even though geographically Minnesota and, and, and California are quite different, there are some similarities that I drew from. Uh, one would be that we got a lot of hand-me-down clothes from the 70s, which we wore in the 80s, so those were a lot of fun to draw. Um, also, you know, our family histories are quite similar, so his dad looks enough like my dad where I could just sort of extrapolate. Um, and um, how many of you have read A, a Different Pond? OK, sweet. If you have any younger brothers or sisters, nieces, nephews, younger kids in your lives, um, it's a nice way to introduce them to the refugee experience of Southeast Asians, particularly Vietnamese. But I know there are a lot of Hmong and, and Cambodian and Lao folks um, 
who share a very, very similar migration experience here and also a similar experience of war um, in their original countries. And then the, the rift that that creates in families is something that I think kids can understand um, because kids understand things one way and parents carry this whole like history and when that history is quite traumatic, oftentimes they don't want to talk about it with their child, but their child can feel it. And that's kind of what the book is about. Um, trauma aside, it was actually quite fun to draw the book because um, Bao shared with me a lot of photographs of his childhood and like there were little things that I recognized like, oh my gosh, I also wore a paper crown like that in my elementary school when it was my birthday. Um, I also had some knockoff Adidas. Uh, this was me though in, in sunny San Diego, California. Um, so there are some things that I didn't understand about Minnesota that Bao had to explain to me, like um, tater tot hot dish. I didn't know what that was. I had to Google it. Um, you know, fishing. I hadn't really been fishing on the side of a freeway. Um, the jello thing with the fruit inside. Uh, but we did, we did have some things in common, like when he told me, could you draw like a jar of fish sauce that my mom would make in like an old Miracle Whip jar? I was like, yes. Um, and I just had to ask him, did your mother cut the carrots in sticks or in flowers? And he said, flowers. And I was like, okay, I got you. So um, one of the things about this that was really, really fun to draw is, um, has anybody seen, has, does anybody watch Stranger Things? So for you, it's like this weird retro um, show, but for like people my age, that's like a serious walk down nostalgia lane. Um, <laughs> Like, that's stuff that we used to have. Um, but it's like a very um, specific kind of Americana that's represented in Stranger Things that doesn't necessarily include some of the like culturally inflected, more specifically Vietnamese things that I also grew up with. So I wanted a place to put those things. Things like um, the, the tin of Danish butter cookies that when you open it up did not contain cookies anymore because your mother had turned it into a sewing kit. That is part of my Americana, um, and, and I wanted a place for it. Also, the free calendar that your parents would bring home from the Asian supermarket, that was like the only decoration on the wall, things like that too. And then jumping into the present day, um, I wanted also in my work to tie my experience of being a refugee and recent arrival in the US um, with more current things. So um, one of the things I was thinking about was policy that prevents people from having that same experience, things like the Muslim ban. Um, and I did this uh, comic with Raina Telgemeier. Do, do I have any fans of Raina Telgemeier in here? She did uh, Smile, Sisters, Ghosts. Yeah, she's got a new book coming out called Guts. Um, she drew this comic and I colored and lettered it. It was written by a third cartoonist. And it's just, we did it for free online as part of like, giving back to, to people, um, just to educate people on what the Muslim ban is. So if you Google her, her name, my name, and Muslim ban, you'll find this comic online. Um, I also have been working a lot in the last year and a half with formerly incarcerated Asian American folks um, because in the last year and a half, two years, I've been learning more about how many of them are actually in ICE detention or have been held in ICE detention immediately following a very, very long prison sentence. And this was something I did not know about. I didn't associate Asian Americans with immigration detention, but actually there are tens of thousands at risk of being deported to the very same countries that we fled as refugees. And many of them weren't even born in those countries because they were born along the way like my brother. So these are the guys, they, I mean, they're, they're some of the most enlightened amazing men that I've met um, because they've been through so much and because they went through so much transformation while they were in prison. They are some of the, the, the most healed human beings I've ever met um, and they are ripe to help other people um, either not go to prison, make different choices, or um, find healing themselves after prison, but they're not allowed to because through the laws that we have right now, they're swept right into the um, deportation pipeline. And it's, um, it's really heartbreaking to see things like um, people who have already been traumatized by war and uh, 
school shootings in their, in their childhoods, um, spend most of their lives in prison, and then get torn from their families after they're all done with that. And if they had been born in the US, they would now be allowed to come back home and begin the healing process. But instead, they're subjected to a second form of punishment because they are not American citizens. Some of them have babies. Some of them um, joined gangs, made poor decisions, went through a lot of rough times because they had lost a parent or because they didn't have a parent with them growing up. And so the idea that their own child would be taken away from them and forced to grow up without a parent, just um, it makes them fear the cycle of violence that'll continue way into the future. And so you can see the ripple effect of a war that happened 40 years ago continuing, not, e not even just to today, but into the next generation too. This is a family whose um, husband and father has already been deported and is in Vietnam right now trying to uh, get that decision reversed and come back to his family in the US. And I believe that they're here in Minnesota. Um, and then there are other Asian Americans who are out in the community fighting for other related issues, like uh, these, uh, the One Nation, if you look up the hashtag One Nation, <laughs> These are Asian Americans primarily fighting um, a, a new rule under the new administration. Um, anybody who uh, uses public benefits like health care, housing subsidies, food stamps, is now going to be considered um, a public charge, meaning that um, they can be barred from becoming an American citizen or even just getting their green card because they use those benefits. And anybody who has come to the US as a new immigrant knows that that's exactly when you need the help. My family got food stamps when we first arrived and it's hard to imagine how we would have survived, much less gone on to thrive and help other people in our careers without that really crucial help in the beginning. So to starve people um, at, that, at that really vulnerable stage is a hugely bad idea, not just for those people but for our, our, our communities as a whole. So there are, um, there's a whole national movement of people under one nation fighting this rule change. And I like, I like to show this because there is a myth that like Asian Americans don't stand up and, and, and speak up about politics um, and they don't organize, but actually they do. Um, maybe I'll just tell you briefly about Art Hack. Um, another thing that I do is, um, I think because I've been like somewhat vocal about like causes that I support um, and I try to help when I can with my art. Um, a lot of organizations tend to come to me to see if I can do this, I can do that, and it gets a little unmanageable because I'm not paid to do any of it um, and also I just don't have enough time to do it all. So one of the things that I thought about in the last year was how could I tap into my community of artists, many of whom are very introverted, stay at home a lot, don't know how to help even if they want to, and, and how can I connect them with the organizations that are doing amazing work but could use more help with the visuals and getting the messages out. So I've been organizing um, occasionally these art hacks where um, I invite uh, an organization to host a meeting with a group of artists that I've invited and they have two hours together. In the first hour, the organization educates the artists about an issue and then in the second hour, the artists brainstorm with the organization how art can be used to um, amplify their message or get the word out or for help in, in some other way. Um, and then they have two weeks to turn around some work for them. And it's all done free. It's all done because people want to help. But it's kind of about, I don't know, organizing is kind of about like running around with extension cords and connecting people into one big awesome garden party. Um, and this was something that we did for the Oakland teachers' strike. We just sent people out to different um, schools where teachers were on strike, and we just asked the teachers, why are you striking? And it was super, it was, I mean, it was so wonderful to hear from the teachers exactly, because they all really, really cared about their students, but um, the reporting in the mainstream media was reporting the teachers' strike as a, as a, mostly as an inconvenience to families and kids wanting to go to school and to the district. But nobody was really talking about the issues behind the strike. And then the other big issue that is kind of the elephant in the room um, is climate change. And it's something that I've been trying to, to um, address th through kind of overlapping with my interest in Vietnam. I spent so much time like reading and writing about Vietnam's past that I wanted to spend some time thinking about its present and future. And I learned that 
Uh, the southern part of Vietnam is one of the hot spots of climate change, uh, a sea level rise in the whole world. Um, so I went there to do some research. When I came back in the fall of 2018 was when all of the roundups of Southeast Asian communities were happening under, um, under ice. And so I had to put this project on hold for a little bit so that I could uh, address the deportations. But climate change continues to be one of the things that I think about and try to figure out how, um, how to talk about it with people. And I might actually be dipping my toes for the first time into um, science fiction as a way to um, as a way to talk about it. So this draws me back to my first problem, which was how to represent the tragedy uh, behind people like Alan Curdy, who, 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 who are the victims of, um, one, the forces that displace them, but also, two, the policies that bar them from finding safety in the world. And I think that the answer for me right now so far is to, know, is to not use the sensational images of people's deaths, but rather to listen to them while they're still alive. Um, and as much as possible, tell stories in their own words. So these are some people, mostly from Afghanistan, actually, who I talked to when I went to the island of Lesbos in Greece this summer um, and interviewed people who were refugees in the camp there and then also people who were um, policymakers and from NGOs and community-based organizations who were there to help them. Um, and what I found is everywhere you go, whether people are called refugees or asylum seekers or migrants or immigrants, they're all the same. They all are fleeing something that was beyond their control and they're trying to get to a better place. And the only things that are in their way are borders, which are man-made, and which have shifted over time. So it's really, really interesting uh, to be on one of the most eastern islands of Greece that used to be actually part of Turkey. And now there are hundreds of thousands of people trying to cross that four miles, four or five miles of water to get from Turkey to Greece, but it's a, it's a constantly shifting border. And um, much could be the sa said uh, that's very similar about the US's southern border with Mexico, which didn't used to be the same border. Finally, um, there's another way to uh, represent refugees, which is to remind ourselves that we aren't always refugees. Sometimes we're just parents. Sometimes we're just artists. And so I'm going to end on a, on a happier note, which is um, it's actually not children of the sea, it's chicken of the sea. And it, um, it's a children's book that um, I made with uh, Viet Thanh Nguyen, who's a very serious writer, and our not so serious little boys, um, Ellison and Hien. Ellison was four years old when he came up with the idea for the book, and he dictated it to his father. And then his father um, refined the language into free verse. And then I employed my son to um, draw all of the pictures for it, and then I colored and lettered them. So the four of us made a book, um, and it's completely silly. It is, has nothing to do with refugees, because Vietnamese refugees would never make a story about pirates. We're scared of them. Um, but hopefully this means that um, the good news is that our kids no longer carry, carry our intergenerational trauma, which means that healing can happen. <laughs> um, stories can get told. Um, and they don't always have to be a huge bummer. Sometimes it's a way for us to um, uh, do better in terms of recognizing uh, the plurality that is our society and um, to understand each other better as neighbors, community members, fellow students. Oh, thank you.